Hello? Hello? Is it that time? I think we're there. I think it's Monday morning. Bring it in. Troops, little Zoom quarantine show. How's everybody doing? David, Adina, how are you guys? All right. Um, I'm a little nervous today because uh, Adina's using Chad's computer, which is a PC, and who knows what's going to happen. Listen, listen. Um, thoughts and prayers. My Apple computer <laughs> is in the shop. Um, it's supposed to get back today, but I was like, nothing shall stop me from doing my special correspondent duty. So if y'all see some craziness, it's because I'm PC macking it and it's like French and English. So Similarly, if I accidentally curse, it's because Adina's using a different computer. Exactly, exactly. I, Henry said before this, he was like, I don't know how you guys are married. Like, Apple. <laughs> Dad hates apples, but that's beside the point. <laughs> he hates them so much. We're dealing with a lot these days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, happy <laughs> home. I'm just trying to keep the peace anyways but we do love basketball and that's the only thing that like it's actually the thing that brought us together um maybe on a slow day i will tell you guys more about it <laughs> but hoops brought us together Wait. okay yeah we're definitely gonna do that okay okay yeah or like at the end of the day what clive, clive frazier is involved that's all i have to say <laughs> promising okay <laughs> so, all right so i am sharing on the pc let's get it so uh we had some good games this weekend which i was really happy about the laker game was the highlight of, of my weekend but uh starting off paul gasol had his daughter and he actually named his daughter elizabeth gianna gasol like is he not the sweetest person in the world like and one of the smartest listen like since this kobe i mean never thought ill of him beforehand oh wait am i doing the thing oh, okay my computer just like looked like the matrix anyway sorry uh, it was bad um but since the Kobe stuff, like, never thought ill of him before. But, you know, he's been so much to the to Kobe's family and the Bryant family. And then the middle name Gianna, it's just, it was super touching. Amazing. And the yeah. little tiny hand, come on. I know. One wasn't, but. All right. So next up is uh, a really One wasn't, but. game where Austin Rivers accidentally bounced the ball off of LeBron's head. And the face LeBron, like LeBron put the fear of God on me. So <laughs> just watch. He found him several times and then fouls him again. Oh, and then Rivers just throws the ball, bats it off LeBron James's head. And James now just walks away. And yeah, that wasn't intentional. He I swatted know. the ball and went off of LeBron's head. Like the face that LeBron, and then the funniest part though is Kuz's reaction. So. <laughs> Yeah. Kuz, he's such a kid. He's such a kid, but I'll go back a little bit. So <laughs> <laughs> was like, you definitely heard the I was just playing. I was just playing from from Austin in that set, in that mood, in that moment. So it was pretty cool. So glad the king calmed down. I mean, he was winning, so what did it matter? Next up, I think we all saw this and just giving a, a recap for those and you know, putting our, our spin and our opinion on it is Russ going Russ um, on a fan, which we later learned out was uh, William Rondo, Rondo's brother. First of all, why does William Rondo sound like a fake name you write on an application? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was his brother. So here's Russ going Russ and discovering the taunting from the... the, um, the this is a terrific all-around game for James. <laughs> Jay Tucker's going to come back in, and Austin Rivers. And someone in the Laker group is talking to Russell Westbrook and waving goodbye to him. AD was laughing. Yeah, AD was just like, this is, he's such a clown right now. I, I'm interested to know what you guys think about this especially i mean I've, I've heard a lot like you shouldn't let people out of your game but we're in a bubble and there are rules like what do you guys think i uh, i'll just give one simple thing i said this months ago it's going to be like aau basketball the only people in the building are direct family members these guys have played a million games in aau when no one comes to those games except for your mom and dad and and, and the next teams that's going to play on the same court as you when you're done their parents from the stands. That's it, uh, and so that's what it's like again. I don't, I don't, I don't love heckling in that weird kind of environment. But I don't think Russ should have, you know, gotten his face, or whatever. Yeah. Um, there's a I bunch of little kids like, around there too. Hope, 
Rajan's okay with this. Like, <laughs> if, if it's killing Rajan, then I'm upset by it, right? But like, if you're undermining your brother with your loud mouth, then that's a problem to me. Like, if it's just like, I don't know. I actually, <laughs> well, Judy can tell you, but everybody knows I like trash talk. I'm generally a fan of it. Um, but, and, and, and Judy's son, I hope you don't mind telling us, like, he likes trash talk a lot. He's like a natural. <laughs> But I keep, I'm like, so now I'm counseling him. I'm like, I'm like, like, Charlie, let's win something. Like, like, then we'll do the trash talk. Like, he likes to trash talk before the event begins. <laughs> but like, I feel like there's certain things. So to me, William Rondo, like, don't hurt the Lakers you're here to support with this, right? Like, if you're yeah. just, but if they're all on board, if Anthony Davis is laughing, if we're laughing, then okay, different story. Yeah, I almost feel like Anthony was laughing at Russ. And I mean, the Lakers did win, right? So his family, but I really will say like, now you're writing, as my grandma would say, you're writing checks, your ass can't cash. But like, Rajon's ass has to can't cash that check, not you, William. And if they lose, I could just see Russ putting up, you know, Instagram, some petty ass posts waving goodbye, right? Like, it's not above him. I will say just like what coach said, though, like, hasn't Russ grown up playing AAU basketball and empty gyms and people yelling? Like, why is this new and why do you f and maybe but maybe he always you know jawed with the person in the audience but I'm like you're a millionaire now not even a millionaire you're just a professional right it has nothing to do with how much you're paid so why are you getting letting this take it take you out your game but I also understand he's probably bitter that he's exiting yeah they were getting blown out too yeah. and, and but he, here's the more important thing the NBA does the NBA is doing as best as they can do given all the circumstances they don't need two people fighting uh, on the parent side, and I'm telling you, if we're going to make the AU comparison, which I'm making, the fights are almost always in the bleachers with parents. <laughs> That's just how it is. I've seen many of them. I've had cops come many times to games. It was never my team or our team's parents who just were politely clapping. But there is a lot of emotion. Imagine NBA every finals. Ever. <laughs> I'm just saying, imagine. Yeah, exactly. We, our, we told our parents, one, one dad used to yell at referees. But most of them did that. But it, it's crazy. So now imagine the emotion of an NBA game. You're going to have a fight. If you allow that, i tell you, it's going to start happening between two adults on the side. And the last thing is, there's a bunch of really young kids. Mm -hmm. They're already yeah, here. There are kids there. They, the parents don't have a choice of getting a babysitter in the bubble, to my knowledge. Yeah. They're bringing those infants and toddlers to the game. Let's just cheer and clap and let the players play. Mm -hmm. I, I guarantee you there's going to be some memos to teams about this. But yeah. it, it hasn't been. Uh, so I've got some more clips of just, I guess you would call it Rondo Gate. I'm not sure. Oh, oh good, good, good. I love adding a gate to anything. I think it's like a journalism sure. Rondo Gate. It so is. here's a clip supposedly of Bill. I want to call him Bill Rondo now. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. I do too. Getting ejected. <laughs> Um, he was super calm about it. And, yeah, for those of you who don't know, Bill Rondo is actually, he heads up the barbershop at the, <laughs> in the bubble, which is very interesting. I mean, I think we all know, like, you know, you get your family hooked up. If I'm in the bubble and my, my brother cuts hair, then he'll be in charge of the barbershop. So now, like, I mean, Russ is thankfully leaving so he doesn't even get his hair cut. But, like, is this going to cause beef elsewhere? Who knows? Or will, you know, Mr. Bill Rondo lose his heading up barbershop duties and here's russ i think it was a it was a tweet from jasmine Walken. she was like here's russ checking to see if there's any more william rondos in the crowd <laughs> russ, <laughs> russ, That's great. russ is like he's just a walking gif and then for those who've seen coming to america this is rondo's brother <laughs> i'll come play i'll come play yeah his mom would call him clay i would call him clay so uh, I don't know if Russ is going to get a cut right before he leaves, but I can imagine. He's gone. There we go. Yeah, he's gone. he's gone. This is Bill Rondo in the barbershop. That is hilarious. That's so funny. Shout out to Josiah, though. Like, he always has some shit, like, right after on Twitter. I love him. That's really funny. Exactly. Are we not going to talk about Bill Rondo's shirt? What was on his shirt? I couldn't read it. Oh, no, I guess anything. It was just an unusual shirt. <laughs> what, a hoodie with short sleeves? Oh, short sleeve hoodie. I see it all the time. Yeah. Everyone's wearing the hoodies now. I love that uh, Henry always notices the, the weirdest thing. I was like, where's his mask? Unless that's a beard. I don't know. 
So there's a yeah. lot of kids in there. Look. Yeah. yeah. We do need to talk about the hoodie short sleeve combo. I'm like, is this what the weather calls for in Florida? I mean, coach, you might know better. It might be cold in the arena, but it ain't cold outside. True, true, true. It might be a fashion beef. Because <laughs> we know Russ, right? Like, Russ yeah. is like, how dare you? How dare you? He's a oh, fashion no. it, A lot of people are wearing those now, though. Mm -hmm. I don't approve. Dwayne Wade, uh, basketball players are people, too. And Dwayne Wade was out here with us. Uh, he put up a tweet that said, I got a Bears win. We got Patty and Gladys singing. I'm eating soul food with my wife and our moms. This is a Sunday for me, y'all. And awesome. Yeah, listen, y'all. I don't, you know, I don't know my fam, my true fam. Y'all know about verses, but yesterday, Miss Patty Labelle and Miss Gladys Knight were on, and it was just, it was Auntie Con, Auntie Chella, Aunt, someone even said Auntie Tifa. I was like, I love it. Chaka <laughs> Con was on. No, we call it like Auntie Con, like Comic Con. It was like Auntie oh, I get it. <laughs> Comic Con. I was like, if Shaka would have came on, that would have just. I was blew excited up. then. Yeah. I know. Dion Dion Warwick did come through, and because. We were all talking last night. I got, I had to bring in a little bit of what happened last night. So, thank you, Dwayne, for bringing it up. And here we are. It was a night. So Ms. Gladys and Ms. Patty brought us home, and uh, it's cool to know that I had the same night as Dwayne Wade. Like sort of. Sort of. I mean, I'm sure our nights were the same. But yeah, if you've got a chance, watch, uh, get that versus going, get your spirit going, especially during these times. But that's all I got for you. Were you good? I thought Was I, I going to sing? Um, maybe towards the end of the show, let's get a crack. <laughs> let's get a crack. <laughs> I feel like I, I don't want to start singing now because people might leave. Um, oh, <laughs> towards the end, I want to keep the viewership. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, do we don't want to take a minute and hear your Chad basketball story? Oh, okay. So Chad and I met um, 2013 NBA draft. I will always remember Anthony Bennett was the number one pick. Where is he now? Um, Canada, I believe. Or was in Canada. Anyway, 2013 draft, we met at Walt Clyde Frazier's restaurant on the west side. Uh, a friend of, not even a friend, just like a person I follow on Twitter was like, yo, you should come to this draft party. And I was like, cool. So I, I didn't have a job. I went and I was like, maybe I'll get a job here. And, uh, you know, sat next to Chad all night. And I had left, one of my friends was there with me and I ignored her all night, which I felt really bad. She, but she was in, she was at our wedding, which is great. <laughs> and we talked about, you know, as a woman, I hate when people challenge me on basketball, especially as like someone who worked at ESPN and things like that. And everyone was there. They were like, what do you think about this guy, this guy? And in my mind, I was just like, yo, everybody's got potential until they fucking play basketball. So I don't necessarily care at this time. And Chad was the same way. He had the same attitude about it all. We also joked about Aaron Hernandez because that was like that around that time and all the memes were up. And then Walt Clyde Frazier comes through the restaurant and I was like, forget you. <laughs> and <laughs> started talking to Walt and I was like, I got a basketball sign for my dad and I love you and the Knicks and then. So I have a picture with Walt Clyde that night, not my future husband, which is great. And uh, yeah. yeah, and then, so you, if you guys have ever been to Walt Clyde Frazier's restaurant, um, there is a small basketball court there. So we went on the court and we were playing and Chad said he saw my jump shot. And I had a great follow through <laughs> and he was like, oh, I... got potential. I wasn't even like, you know, dressed scantily clad. I just, I, I was wearing like a paper bag of a dress and, but it was just like the jump shot is what I got. <laughs> That's pretty nice. <laughs> is it really called Walt Clyde Frazier? As if we don't know who he is, if you just call him Clyde. It's, it's called Clyde's Wine and Dine, That's but right. I, yeah. yeah. And then the walls of the booth, they have um for, like, fur on them like faux fur like for his jackets yeah yeah like his, and so does the menu so it's really dope what are people are asking it wasn't the defense uh no apparently it was my offense here if only he knew that was that was all he was gonna get in offense <laughs> <laughs> um Adina, did i meet you that same day no did I, you? I feel like i met you at a draft but maybe not that year no we so i met chad at the I'm like, was I at the, no, we met at Barclays, at a Barclays draft, I feel. I don't know. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I think yeah, it was, it was at a, not that year. 
Yeah, but it was a draft. We did meet at the draft. And I was yeah, like, this yeah. is the man, the legend, the myth. That's what I was thinking about you. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and so, and Walkhead used to own the store club, if I'm not mistaken, which was like a, like one of Manhattan's legendary, like late night jazz spots back in the day when he was like playing for the Knicks. I'm pretty yeah. sure, someone correct me if I'm wrong, I'm pretty sure he owned or co-owned the store club. I, I don't doubt it. He seems like a person who needs to get that fit off. So he would just start his own club, just get his fit off. Uh, yeah. What guys, I mean, if, I don't know if he was doing well um, post before COVID, but I mean, it was always a good spot to watch. Not that I'm plugging, but hey, walk lives. Uh, it was a good spot to watch games. And he would actually, when there was a Nick game, he would just walk on over and come through for like 30, oh, 40. Cool. Man. Yeah, I, I've been there during games and I'm like, so this man lives in his own restaurant and I love it. It was great. He, I spent three hours interviewing him for that uh, bas basketball a love story uh, documentary series. I yeah. loved him that one. It was like such a great assignment. They're like, would you, could you do this? Are you available next Thursday? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I'm available. Um, Walt but, Clyde. Uh, Gotta say the whole name. I said, I don't know why. Walt Clyde Razor. Um, but he uh, told me so many fascinating things. But um, to the two that stick with me right now, one is he's like months at a time in, I think, Barbados. Yes, like, I have. So he does like the NBA season, does his Nick games, and then he's just like, he's like, I don't wear shoes for like <laughs> these months, like no shoes. I'm like, That's <laughs> and then the other thing was, um, he just, at the end, we were done. Like we were done. Like they were breaking down tripods and stuff. And he just goes on this thing, which was just like a good six minutes of like cranky old man where his girlfriend thinks that he is messy in the kitchen. Mm. Not messy. He's got a system for the whole thing. And he needs to have like peanut butter right here and the mangoes right here. And he like had the whole like, and she like puts it away. But he's like, no, it was away. Like that's exactly <laughs> where we needed it. <laughs> like, like, just was like. I'm telling like, Chad that. Yeah. He's like human, you know, he's like a regular guy. <laughs> There's a method to my madness. I'm going to, cause I, I just like that. I'm like, I'm going to call it the Clyde madness. Yeah, method. Yeah, yeah. I literally finished the interview and I called like the producers and I was like, there's this thing about Clyde with how he keeps the kitchen. I think you got to do something with it. Like you can't, like it's too valuable. <laughs> Seriously. Like there's no way we're doing that. You idiot. <laughs> oh my God. Write that article, write the book, cookbook. Yeah. 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 The untold story. Um, okay. We have a lot to talk about. Um, yeah. Did you guys know that there was uh, there's an exciting game seven tomorrow after an exciting game six last night? How about that? Let's go. Um, David, do you want to tell us what's going to happen tomorrow? Are you asking me if I'm if I want to talk about who's going to play <laughs> 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 or who I think is going to win? I mean, the Clippers should have closed the series out the last two games. When you're up 17 in the second half, late in the third quarter in game five, they're up 17. I don't remember when they were up 17 or 16 yesterday. But um, the, and they're not playing great, and they're still up big, and they just can't close it out. And there's a few things going on. Jokic is happening. Like, that is a thing. You're being jokic -ed. He's just otherworldly. And I'm, I'm not – I don't typically speak in hyperbole about players. Uh, he, I'm, I tend to be pretty sober about things, but Jokic is just blowing me away. Uh, he's just such an incredible offensive talent who is blocking 1.2 shots a game in this series after averaging 0.6 blocks per game during the entire regular season. So clearly he's stealing the effects of everyone yelling at him for the Utah series. I mean, Utah still has the number one offensive rated team in the bubble. Of course, they're not there anymore, but it wasn't for a lack of offense. Uh, and then the Clippers are really getting nothing from what they expect anyway from Lou Williams and Montrez Harrell, their double-edged you know, monsters off the bench who have just been below average. They have been. They each average over 18, point, 18 points a game, and they're not there now. And I think, uh, I think Harold's highest point total in uh, the playoffs is 15, and Lou's is 14. And again, they both average 18. So, like, they need a game where they score 25 30, which is possible, and they haven't literally haven't done half of that. So, um, I mean, the Clippers are the better team, and you would think – I did think Lou started playing better the last game. Montrez did not play well last game. He played better before that a little bit. Uh, but I, I, I feel like Lou has just not been in the group. You know, Westbrook said something really informative when he, after game five, said, everyone else in the playoffs is trying to you know, play playoff basketball. I'm just trying to catch a groove, catch a rhythm. 
I, I was out with my hamstring issue with COVID where he's not doing anything in three weeks. That's, that's meaningful. So Lou Williams and Montrez both have the same kind of thing. And you can see Lou struggling with it. I thought Lou found something, something. Remember, Lou Williams, guys, is, uh, is not a considered a great three-point shooter, but was at 35.5%, I think, this year from three all season on a good number of attempts. It is something he's doing more now that he can't always drive to the rim because he's 64 years old. Uh, in this playoff series, I think he's like three of 23. And I just thought last game, he was mid-range jumpers were a little better. I think he scored 14 points. I think that, I think that if Lou can get back to that, there's their third guy. And, um, and then it becomes harder for Denver to guard him. But it's a toss up. Jokic is so special. Uh, the Clippers can't just guard him and know they can shut everyone else down because he's such a brilliant passer. So it, it can be an amazing game, which aren't always the case for game sevens. Like two minutes into the bubble, you were like, wow, the Heat are like the most connected, like, like well-prepared yeah. team. Um, yeah. How do the Clippers rank on that scale? Yeah, just they're just – I don't think they're broken. They're just – they're not clicking for long. You, you look at it this way. So – Every team, including the worst teams in the league, including the Knicks even, who, who almost aren't an NBA team, uh, they have moments. <laughs> Sorry, Adina. That's crazy. That was mean. That was <laughs> pure mean. I'm not a mean person. I apologize for that. You've come a long way from while Clyde Frazier talked. No, that was just truthful. <laughs> it wasn't mean. It was just truthful, but the truth hurts. It's cool. Uh, every team has moments and runs, right? The, the bad teams have few, but they have them. The great teams have many. Okay, the Clippers just aren't coming up with many. And they, they just kind of, I, I would say they lose focus. They're missing shots they wouldn't normally miss. That goes to do with Denver's hustle and, and force that they're playing with. Uh, the article we published today has a plumly hammering uh, Montreal from the rim. Like Denver is bringing something that they haven't always played with. Uh, but the Clippers just aren't stringing together long periods. Uh, and then, so let's say they go on a 15-2 run and then Denver makes a little comeback. Then the Clippers would shoot on another like 9, 10, 11. They're not doing that second run, that third run. They can't string it together. They're not as connected. And I'll tell you the other thing, and I told this to Henry a week ago, two weeks, maybe 10 days ago. If, uh, if you watch the Clippers games, you'll see three or four guys standing up coaching sometimes. I don't think that's a great sign. I don't mind on occasion a defensive coordinator standing up, especially in the bubble where you have room, and making sure the team knows what's coming, whatever. But they've got a lot of chiefs right now. Sam Cassell is going for a job. He's rumored, uh, I just read it yesterday, rumored Rockets. to be a, where? Rockets. Really? Yeah. Yes, of course, where he won championships, right. Yeah. So um, I, I don't know that they're auditioning. And I think their heart's in the right place. But they need to have one voice. It needs to be Doc's voice. He's the boss. And, and I also think that we give Kawhi, this is going to sound sacrilegious, so I'm, Maybe I'm stupid. So, Henry or Adina, if you think I'm stupid, just tell me. Or Gerard, when you come on, tell me I'm stupid. Kawhi has this legendary, uh, 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 iconic uh, brand now because he won two championships on two different teams. He wasn't the best player on the first time he won the championship. Let's be clear about that. He was the MVP. He was the best player in that series, in my opinion, and, and wasn't all year long for sure. And for the Raptors, Freddie Van Vliet was unbelievable. They don't win that series for sure. And Golden State was playing like their eighth and ninth man a lot. Yeah. Looney was hurt. Thompson was out. Durant was hurt. Cousins was out. Come on. Yep. So right now, Kawhi's playing fine. He, he ain't playing Jokic ball. And I don't hear anything from him. There's no leadership on there. LeBron owns this team for the Lakers. He owns it. And Davis is right there with them. And there's no division, which is very important with two great players. I don't see that for the Clippers. And that's why they're in game seven with a team that I think the Lakers would fucking smash. Mm. Smash these guys. They would smash them. Not so the Clippers have a long way to go and can get there, but they're not there now. Not stupid. That's what I'm saying. Henry, am I stupid? <laughs> I don't think it's stupid. It's Monday morning and like the entire chat is dedicated to alcohol right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that right? I wasn't even looking. <laughs> 
I never look at the chat, Jerry. I thought it was cool what you were saying, Coach, about um, the Chiefs, like, standing on the on the sideline. Like, I never even thought about that. There should always be one main focus. And how it, it's theater, right? You even talked to us about the theater that you would perform and the calls you would make. And when I was watching the Laker game, the announcers were highlighting D- Dwight and JaVel, how – they're obviously they're not chiefs, but how there's a difference between the theater where Javi- Dwight and Javel, they're like, I don't know, like jesters. They're like jesters. They're like absolutely they're, 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 they are a clown show. Yeah. But that that's what they were supposed to be for that series. Because Houston wasn't allowed them to play with the way Houston plays. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was I, I don't think it was unique to LA. I think any team would realize these in the playoffs, you know, sometimes the way the rotations work, it changes. But they embraced it fully. They were absolute gestures. You're right, Adina. But in the next series against either team, oh, those guys are playing a lot. Yeah. Because both both Denver and the Clippers play centers. Plumlee and Jokic for Denver, obviously in reverse order. And Montrez sometimes, Zubac a lot at the five. Like, they're playing, they're going big. We might see Joakim Noah in, in, the, in a Lakers series. So JaVale and Dwight won't be clowning anymore. They're going to have to play. But I, the, the Lakers just seem they same thing in Portland series. They had a one bad game. And I mean, they, they fucking destroyed Houston, who, mm-hmm. who is pretty good. Like, they're good, if not very good. Uh, Houston might be able to win the East. I'm not, I'm not telling you they can't win the East. They could not win the West. The Lakers smashed them. That, there's, that's, some, that's meaningful. Mm-hmm. Bye, Caleb. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I... Uh, um, Judy, do you mind showing David's story from today? Um, there's this little moment of um, basketball that really struck me. And so if we scroll to the... Um, it's one of the GIFs. Um, Is it the Jamal I'm Murray GIF? losing my mind. Yeah, the second GIF here. This one. Yeah, right there. This. Yeah, right there. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're Mata we're gets to this, steal. David? Yeah. So basically... Uh, Jamal Murray is guarding, I think, Paul George in the left cor- in the right corner. I think it's Paul George. It's a small screen. And there's a pick and roll on the other side of the floor, and Jamal r- runs way over there to kind of get in the way of the pick and roll. Harrell's, Montrez Harrell's rolling, and so we call it Jamal's tagging Montrez's roll. So it's Jamal's tag to make sure he can't just get an easy lob. And so in this point, it's a, it's oh, a yeah. seven-point game. It's the beginning of the fourth quarter. It's obviously a competitive game. But the point we're making in the article is Denver for two straight games has had opportunities to say, we're done. Let's just go home. But Jamal shows that they're, they're bringing it. Like, he covered a lot of ground to tag Montrez on the pick and roll, which also could have been a dunk on his head. And it's because little, of that... It's little Jamal running a long way to put his body in front of big Montrez. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> and, and, of course, they get a steal. Monte gets a layup, and it's a five-point game. And, and this is what Denver has done. And... What's really interesting, I think, at least to me, is I thought Mike Malone used to be more of a hard ass. And I didn't love that. I think there's a place for hard ass on occasion at every level. Very rare in the NBA. These are grown men that are highly competitive. And I thought at Sacramento he was that way, and I didn't like him at all. But now he's a cheerleader. That's not to suggest he's not running great stuff. He is. That's not to suggest he isn't orchestrating on offense. I mean, I told you guys at the beginning – Jokic's usage rate was 26% going into the playoffs. Murray's was 24. That's expert coaching strategy. It's not 35% Jokic. Jokic is more effective when you get a little less of him. You can't just orient yourself around the one guy. And it's good for Jamal Murray to get some oxygen. And we saw what happened to Jamal in the first round against against Utah. And, And now that Jamal has been guarded better, Pat Bev does that to people, and Paul George and Kawhi, They've all guarded Jamal to some extent. And Jamal came down to earth a little bit too. It's been more Jokic. And so I think, I think Mike Malone's done an expert job with the Nuggets, but he's also been a great cheerleader. He's not been a tough ass. He needed to be in the Utah series a little bit, and they responded. So he's grown a lot in my eyes as a coach for sure. And, uh, and Denver, Denver, I tell you what, Denver's going to be down 17 in this game potentially. It won't matter. The one fear I have is that both coaches will do – Henry knows what I'm going to say. They'll go to the, oh, we're not allowed to sub in the fourth quarter or second half anymore. And we're going to see two exhausted teams score, you know, be 75-74 with three to go in the fourth. That would be <laughs> disappointing. Get your subs, play your moments, rotation. Like mm-hmm. tired Jokic is the least 
NBA like moving person you'll ever see in an NBA uniform. <laughs> like, <laughs> he, said- he, you would think you're, it's like, you, well, Adina's too young for this, but Adina, do you remember when albums existed? Like the big ones? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> so we, we, we could play them sometimes. I think it was on uh, 78, the really slow yeah, speed. Ones, yeah. And it'd be really slow. That's Jokic. He's on a 78 album when he's tired because he's slow to begin with. Oh, it was 45 when you played on 45. It's 78. I thought that was like the small oh, one. 78 was faster? Yeah, so 78 revolutions per minute, right? Oh, is that what it was? I didn't know. I never yeah. knew. I'm not a math so, guy. I'm a basketball guy. So, yeah, you play the little record of 40, at 45 revolutions per minute because it was called a 45, right? But then, oh, okay. That's yeah. right. That's this right. This is so ridiculous. <laughs> oh, Jokic is a 74. He's a 78, or I'm confused now. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, Jokic was slow. So, Judy's making fun of us for dating ourselves as if all of this gray doesn't let you know I'm not 25. Yeah. <laughs> there are some other tells. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> But Denver, let's let's say this. Um, they they're young. Like if they manage this right, they'll lose Millsap, which they can afford to lose Millsap. He was very important in Game Five, but really a non-factor in every other quarter. Uh, if you're Denver, if you're a stock, like you're betting heavy on Denver. They're they're a team when you think forward-looking, like they're not going to get worse, and they're pretty damn good now, right? Well, when I you know, I'm always big on like, we should already trust some young players who we've been bringing up through our system so that by now in big games, you can put them in games. And they have like a lot of Tory Craigs and Gary Harris's out there on this team, right? This is what we're talking about. This they're putting, they're doing it. Well, and you, you made a point to me, Henry, on a phone call earlier, you where my, so, so MP, MPJ, Michael Porter Jr. has been the most selfish player in the bubble for sure. At what point, I think he had two assists, maybe three for the entire playoffs. And it was just like a couple of games ago and a, and a decent number of baskets. He doesn't play all that intelligently, in my opinion. He is very inexperienced. But, um, uh, and I think uh, Gerard caught him. He got a big rebound, I think, at the end of game five. And instead of, he, I mean, it was the game, game-saving game rebound. Instead of grabbing it, protecting it, he put it to his hip and, like, started celebrating. And they almost got a jump ball out of it because that was just brain stupid. But... He's, he's starting to do more. And then Henry made a point, I think, he went down in a crash and three nuggets ran over to him to pick him up. Is that, is that what happened, Henry? Yeah, in the second quarter, he, like, uh, yeah. you know, he tried to make some tough layup and I think missed, but um, went down hard. And as soon, before he hit the ground, three nuggets were sprinting to him. And I know it's common for a player to run over to help you up in the NBA, but three got my attention. They were coming from far away. And I was like, this is the guy – who kind of trashed the team on video yeah. just a few days ago um, and, you know, does some selfish things. I was like, that's a pretty amazing sign. Actually, I, this is what we're talking about. Judy, can we watch that little video I tweeted? Um, oh. You know what I'm talking about, David? I don't know. I saw you put in the thing, but I didn't look at it yet. Um, oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. Can you um, – What was – What's angle we maybe can't see, but his foot is out of bounds. So, okay. He's running at a guy who's out of bounds, and he yeah. jumps and gets big while he's flying out of bounds, which means if the ball touches him anywhere, it's clipper ball. <laughs> I'm like, oh, are you jumping? Just get which small is, right then, right? Which is right, exactly so, what happened, right? Then was it clipper ball? Yeah, yeah it was clipper ball. It went off, it went off MBJ. So what, what, what initially he's doing is hustling, yeah. uh, and, and he's afraid he's going to save the ball to a teammate. But what he should have done is backed up and caught the ball. Yeah. Yeah. He put himself in position to clearly have it bounced off him. He's just, yeah, he's inexperienced. Um, he's, he's got a lot of growing to do. I, I told this to Gerard last week or two weeks ago. I don't know that he's ever going to make it. Like I told, I told, I think I upset Gerard. He loves him. I said, you know, he might be just another Zach Levine, like a, a, just a, a really, really great scorer that just doesn't know how to win games. And, and that's a good segue very quickly into LeBron. Uh, we, we can talk more with the Lakers uh, next time, but um, when they play again. But LeBron, like the great – they really know how to win games. The little thing – LeBron would not have made that mistake, Henry. No. Like, not even remotely close to any of the vicinity of that mistake. This is that no. thing we were talking about uh, last week. I was – Processing with CP. Are we, like, how many times per second are you processing where everything's that's happening right. on the court, right? And this is like – Kyle Lowry practices two, three times a second. He's processing the whole scene, right? He knows where the ref is, where the players are. Like, no way Kyle Lowry does that, right? right. This is where Michael Parker right. might or might not 
process, get a, right. you know, it's, a, it's obsessive and weird to process that much, right? Chris and and experience, know. reps and experience matters. So I'm not at all yeah. suggesting MPJ right. can't learn to play smarter. Of course he can, but I'm allowed to wonder if he will. Based yeah. on what I've seen, my own instincts, whatever, Zach Levine hasn't figured it out yet. And I don't know that Zach ever will. Maybe he will. He's not, he's not, had, some, he's not had a lot of good coaches. And, and, and you know, it's, it's not like, no coach has ever tried to coach some of these guys to play smarter. It's not, it's not they're not giving good advice. It's how do you get them to do it? There's yeah. better coaches get players to be mindful of moments, be thoughtful of moments, prepare for moments, and with the right coaches, they'll... <laughs> You okay, Gerard, Gerard, Gerard's, Gerard's crush. Come on, Gerard. <laughs> I was like, can we check on him? And so yeah. my, go do a wellness check right now. Let's do a wellness check on him. And I, I, Gerard, Gerard, he told me this on the phone the other day. I didn't know. I don't really pay attention. To, if you're not a lottery pick, I don't really pay much attention. Or a top five pick, I should say. And uh, I didn't know much about him because he didn't play at Missouri because he was hurt. Uh, and apparently, he said the GMs had been wondering about him as a thinker, but I, I, you know, he can get coached up. So to your point, who to Henry about his teammates running to him, that didn't happen in a vacuum. So yeah. something has happened. It, it might just be the, the overwhelming feelings of, Hey, we're competitive with the Clippers. It, it may be that, or it might be some humility for Michael Porter Jr. Behind closed doors mm. in a meeting, right. Where, where they, he just realized he screwed up. Yeah. And when you, when you meet your team halfway, especially in this situation, they're going to come right there. Hey, hey, young fellow, let's go. You're, you, you show some humility with us. We're going to show right back to you. That's how champions are made, to be honest with you. Yeah. You've got to get through some conflict. You've got to get through some adversity to connect better. Judy, can we wellness check Gerard? Is he wearing a shirt? What's going on? I want to also, Judy, after we finish with Gerard, or not finish with Gerard, bring him in, this tweet that Bilal sent about yeah. Jokic, it yeah. totally sums up what coach said. If you could show that. <laughs> oh, I didn't see it. Um, it says, every time I watch <laughs> Nikola Jokic play basketball, I think about <laughs> how people say Bumblebee shouldn't technically be able to fly. I've actually never heard that, but it's hilarious. <laughs> Makes so much sense. <laughs> <laughs> Big honey. Big honey, apparently Shaq calls him. I didn't know that. Yeah. What up? Uh, you're okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm, look. <laughs> the thing about it, it's like what you said, Adina, you know, like the truth hurts. Like, yeah, I know this about Michael Porter Jr. And this is why I'm like, you know, like he, and first to start, like I am a sucker for tall dudes who can score from every level. Like that, like I just, I fall in love with that, which is why, you know, if I was a GM, I'd have to have a person next to me been like, yeah, we know he's tall and can score at all levels, but there are 98 other things he doesn't do well. And it's like, right, 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 right. Here's those other things. But th that's true. And those were the talks about him is like, the maturity level in terms of coach, coach, what you said, not being selfish, understanding the larger game at play, the, the, the details about how you win a game. It may not be me scoring 35 points. Like I may have to grab 10 boards and box out and know what the hell I'm doing when a screen comes, which clearly he doesn't, right? Like all those little things that like the drilling part of the game that like he might, he might not. I don't know. Um, I hope he gets it. I like right. it. I like that what Henry said about three dudes running over to him. I, I, I don't, maybe that means they all talked to him in the locker room and those that was like, Hey, dumbass. Like, that's not what we do here. Like uh, whatever it is. But I thought the, the funny thing about when I was like, I'm praying he gets it ironic because he's like this Mr. Faith, like Jesus thing. And I'm like, yo man, Jesus is a pretty humble dude. Like, <laughs> you know, like take some lessons and get some humility from that dude. Right. Like it's in the work, man, do that stuff. So anyway, we'll see. How many assists would Jesus have? Jesus, <laughs> right? Like, Porter might, Porter might have doubled his total like in one game because he had so few. Uh, before I forget, I want to get Gerard's thoughts on um, on the Austin Rivers play. And I'm pretty critical of Austin Rivers. I think he's, I think he's not amounted to what he could have, and I think he's actually got some talent. Uh, but I, I, I don't like the way people are reacting to how he settled it. He did not mean to hit LeBron in the head. He was no. frustrated. They're about to get kicked out of the bubble. They're getting blown out. And the absolute right thing to do is to, is to have integrity. The integrity is, I'm not looking to start a fight on a court with anyone, much less LeBron James. If I hit him in the head, I'm going to say, hey, man, that's yeah. exactly what you're supposed to do. And LeBron mm -hmm. handled it just right. Wait, people are Austin mad at Rivers is not soft. If you watch that dude play, there's nothing soft about him. I'm, I'm with you, Coach. I think, look, 
you know what social media and Twitter is like. Jokes are greater than facts, right? Yeah. Like, so we got to get these funny memes off and make fun of him for like, oh, look at Austin, he's scared. Like, uh, like Bleacher Report, like immediately, like, that's what they got to do, like, because that get, gets the clicks and everybody talking. <laughs> but like, no, like Austin isn't like a punk or scared. Like, if you watch him play, like Austin's a tough dude. Like, yeah, like he gets a rap because he's Doc's kid and all that other. Yeah, 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 yeah. But like, you know, it's just it's definitely just a stand up thing to do. Like, my bad, you know, like you said, well, no one it or not. It was an accident. Like, it was definitely an accident. I just thought LeBron, I was looking at LeBron's reaction. Like, <laughs> you know, it was like, what the fuck? And then he just calmed down. It was oh, like, I agree. LeBron, LeBron handled it exactly how he should have handled it. You thought someone threw the ball in your head. You turn <laughs> around and if Austin puffs up, they're not going to fight. But no one's going to fight. You, know, you don't need that. No. <laughs> Our game is beautiful enough as it is. We don't need that stuff. And, and I'll, I'm, I'm sensitive to this point. Everyone loves to make fun of the guy that falls down when he gets crossed over or gets dunked on. And it drives me crazy. Because it's literally the antithesis of what we want our players to do. You're asking them not to be competitive for fear or failure. Right. Yeah. We don't want that. I've, I've seen that. It's called the and one bullshit. I didn't watch that more than eight <laughs> seconds. Yeah. I stopped watching that bullshit. Nobody was competing. Wow. It wasn't basketball. Did I ever tell you guys about uh, Chad coach a Jewish league like of like third graders? Crazy. Jewish and I, I don't like where this is going, by the way. I don't know. <laughs> that, well, okay, there was one kid named Shlomo. Shlomo. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's saying, Shlomo yeah. always had an attitude. I, and um, Chad told him to play man to man. And Shlomo's like, no, I'm not playing man to man. And they're like, why? He's like, because we're going to get crossed over. And that's embarrassing. Yeah. And yeah. we are breeding a generation of kids who don't want to get crossed over and don't want to play man-to-man. -man. A generation of shlomos. As, as, as Bomani Jones always says, zone is for cowards, right? Like, come on, like, D up, get in front of your man and just D and compete. D up. You might get beat. Like, it happens. Like, all right. we, we, with all the players I've coached uh, with my son's team, AU, and then for our, his high school teams, we, we did exactly the way I would learn growing up and as a young coach. Uh, we never, ever mocked our opponent. If we did, our guys got in big trouble. If mm. we cross them up, we're supposed to cross them up. Let's do it again next time. But we're mm. never going to laugh at them ever. I don't care what the score is. And, and if we dunk on them, great. And if we get dunked on, we clap. Way to compete. Try to block. Pat you ain't got dunked on anyone. You want to call him soft? <laughs> Come on now. That dude's one of the best defensive players we've ever seen. In college, he was, he was Georgetown basketball. It was John Thompson, and then it was Pat Ewing. There mm. is no Hoya. Uh, paranoia without first Pat Ewing. I was, I was living as a, as a young coach, um, uh, seeing the effects of what those guys did for college basketball. So uh, I, I'm just real sensitive to the idea that, that they're supposed to be fighters, and yet we're afraid to have them compete. I don't, I doesn't watch with me. Apologizing takes a lot, and that's what Austin did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got a little PTSD from that moment, to be totally honest. Like in, in eighth grade, we were doing some drill and uh, we had a, a very yelly coach. And um, the, <laughs> ball, the ball like, went to the far side of the gym. Near, I was in the back of the line. So I like hooked the ball to the front of the line. And the coach like does a weird kind of like, I, he was looking at me, but he wheels around kind of wide and like into the path of this long pass I've sent. And now it just crushes him in the back of the head. And like fast forward, like 19 seconds later, he's literally holding me against the bleachers. My feet are not on the ground. I'm an eighth grader. This is like a pretty, and he's like, like giving me, I'm like, ah, and I just like when, when LeBron wheeled around, I had a little moment of like, oh, I know how this goes. Like, I know how Austin feels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like LeBron Austin didn't mean it. He, was like, <laughs> he didn't mean it. You know, yeah. it, it's an interesting thing where we talk about this idea of, you know, not want to get crossed up. You don't want to be on social and be a highlight. Like there's an interesting connection between all of that, right? And sort of Ben and his issue with not shooting, right? And not wanting to be like all over TV yeah. and social being showed like bricking or airballing shots, right? And and then this weird sort of like because we're at True Hoop, we're not into the super macho tough guy thing. But then also, right, that connection between a, someone like Ben who doesn't like that sort of like aggressive in your face coaching or like that a teammate like Jimmy Butler would give him, right? It's this weird sort of convolution of, okay, we want you to be tough and aggressive and, and, and all this, but then it's also like, but a super aggressive thing as a coach, we may not like it. And Jimmy may be too abrasive. It's a very strange amalgamation of what we want between aggression and being a good human, right? Like it's, it's very interesting.
Oh, Gerard, I love this little thing you're bringing up here and there's a lot to it, but like, I think if we start with like um, this question that uh, MBA GM said to me, it's like, you know, who does it benefit, right? So like whatever you're doing in life, just think about who's it for, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, a lot of things you do in basketball, um, like if you pass out of the double team or if you allow yourself to be dunked on because you're contesting like crazy at the rim, the benefits to the team, right? You don't look good in those moments. You don't get a higher salary in those moments, right? Mm -hmm. Scorers get paid. But if you do things that aren't scoring and help your team, then like it's not for you. So obviously as a team and, you know, winning is a team thing, right? If you want to win as a team, then you want to celebrate those things. Um, but the tension is we're all, you know, we're all a little selfish. We've got all these tendencies to do things that are like, you know, you don't want to look stupid. Slow-mo doesn't want to look stupid, right? Awesome. Which is about slow-mo in the cafeteria, not slow-mo hoisting a trophy, right? Like, um, so to me, that's like, this is always going to be attention is can you coax people to care about the group, you know, as opposed to the individual Coach, that's the game of basketball. You, did you do um, rewards for offensive, offensive charges or Ruby. do you? Yeah. Did I reward my players that took defensive charges, you mean? No, that took offensive charges. That took them. Yeah, so in other words, my, I, I'm rewarding my defender, though, for yeah. getting run over. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, in my coach, we, it, was, it was hamburgers. I think Chad's was pizza, and I was just wondering. And <laughs> so, once again, I'm, yes, I want to take the charge, but do I want pizza? Is it a pizza a trophy? <laughs> but basically, you know, sacrificing yourself for the greater good and also a cheeseburger. But we, I couldn't have afforded that because we took in – one, in one game, we took 15 charges. Ooh, that's, <laughs> yeah, we made a trash talk. Did you see that? That was tricky. <laughs> yeah. uh, we uh, we we valued it so much, and I taught it. I mean, I literally teach it from impact, how not to hit their head. Like you're trying to protect your athletes. Uh, but when I was a JV coach, all those varsity kids ended up having played for me, and then they matriculated to varsity. And so I would end our our pregame warmups with a drill called a shell drill, which is a defensive movement drill. And I added a charge in the drill while the, we did the last thing before the game started while the referee is on the court. Because they're always on the court the first few minutes of warm-ups, whatever, especially for JD, because the game is 6.15 and the guys are driving from work, whatever. Mm -hmm. A whole varsity team would stand up during the shell drill. Home or away, it didn't matter. All my guys were there, watch our JV team. And then we ended up taking two charges in this drill. And our team would erupt erupt in applause our varsity team in the bleachers when we would take the charge against ourselves in pregame warm-ups and then i had a very intelligent young man named james reddish who would have been a first round pick in the nfl and broken his back james lives in houston now uh and james would always yell his very loud voice he was first team all state uh, defensive in football he would scream at the referees that's what we do we practice taking charges he would plant the seed i had put james up to this by the way I knew what I was doing. I wanted those refs to know we value taking charges. It's not an accident. We're being run over. So, mm -hmm. and we probably got a few more calls a game because of it. But it's a huge part of the game. Conversely, I tell my players, quit fucking running people over. <laughs> I'm not a smart guy with that. Stop running people over. I uh, saw the this. other day, uh, yeah. Gary Harris trucked someone. Uh, no, Tory Craig trucked Paul George. He was five feet from the rim and like a loose ball. Just jump up and shoot it. But he had to float forward, and, and PG took it right there. It's just a bad play. Don't run people over. I saw this one team. I can't remember what um, Long Island basketball team. So you talk about practicing taking charges yeah. in warm-ups. I saw their warm-up. They practiced flopping. Like, literally. No way. What? They were, I swear to God. They were, like, that doing hot feet, story. hot feet. And then when the, when the coach would, like, do two whistles, it was like, hot feet, oh, and then we're down. And <laughs> it was kind of amazing to see, but I was like, how, why would you even do that? <laughs> Although the I charge tell... is the original flop. The charge is the sanctioned flop, right? <laughs> like, oh, in my, in my gym, we were measuring. Everybody's like, no, that's how we were taught. Like, it's okay. But like, that, there is a little art to it, right? <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah, you have to, and you don't want to take too much contact. You don't want to get too much contact. But I want to tell a pregame story I think Gerard really appreciate because I think you were uh, around back when this team was great. So it was my first year of coaching, I think. And Bobby Hurley took his team, the coach Hurley, not Bobby, Bob Hurley took his team, St. Anthony's, yep. to a tournament about an hour and a half away from us. And their best player's name was Roderick Rhodes. Number two player in the country, went to Kentucky. Our, our best player, who's now the best coach in this area, but back then, 
He was a, our, our, the best player on our team, best in our area. He drove to see the game. I didn't go with him. But I, I wanted him to go. And he came back. He went with some friends. And I said, what would you think? St. Anthony was number two in the country that year uh, at that time. He says, Coach, their whole 20-minute pregame warm-up, they didn't use a basketball one time. <laughs> and I said, now – and I, I didn't know that, but I knew they really, they really taught a lot of defense. I told him, Larry, I said, now you understand why we're spending so much time on defense. So we won the championship – Later that year, he had a three to win the game for us, but we really guarded. And I'm, it was because Bob Hurley's pregame warm-up. The guys totally bought into defense because St. Anthony's didn't touch a basketball warm-ups. It was all R defensive slides. RIP to St. Anthony's, a program that no longer exists. Oh. Yeah. But no, Bobby, I mean, Coach Hurley Sr. Was, was, he was incredible. That was one of the great programs. Oh, yeah. Do you remember Kerry Kittles? Yeah. Yes, Kittles. Hey, do you remember Kerry Kittles? Of course. Yeah. I have a pair of his basketball shorts. Not like his, his, but like. Not, 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 I, I walked into his wedding. I'm not even kidding. I, 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 uh, you did what? You walked in? A weird, a weird deal. Um, the NBA New had Jersey? its referee pre-draft camp at a hotel on the waterfront in Jersey City. Mm. I don't know. This, it's often there, actually. But, um, and then I took a water taxi. That I was meeting my family in Manhattan afterward. It was a beautiful summer evening. This is like august maybe early september um the nba season's about to start and um i got out of the water taxi you know way downtown in manhattan that beautiful there's a park and a big hotel and you know what i'm talking about and um mm -hmm. so i was just walking up the the west side highway and um and there's this like i think there was even like a horse-drawn carriage maybe or certainly some very ornate vehicle and there's a beautiful wedding happening like they're, they're posing for the photos i think it's like a little mum between the ceremony and the reception and I'm like, oh, this is nice. Look, they, you know, everyone's just so nice, you know. And I'm like, that's motherfucking Carrie Kittles. Like, I'm telling you, it was like, it was Carrie Kittles and his wife and there the other NBA players and the wedding party. And, um, and I had covered him. I, I covered that Nets team when he was there a little bit. And, what, um, what did you think of him? Because I'm going to tell a story about him. What did you think of him? <laughs> uh, it's, a good, it's a good story. It's an amazing okay. story, actually. I, I, I mean, he seemed like a nice guy. Um, I, I feel like the, that was Jason Kidd, like, you know. I remember. Ring the blood from the stone from everyone i feel like carrie was a little bit of like never quite a thousand percent it like he always seemed a little bit anyway there you go interesting so i, I think what i was going to tell is i went to, we another one of these christmas tournaments my team was in and it was all like the best teams in the country invited this tournament for high school carrie played for st augustine high school in new orleans and uh uh it looked like georgetown the head coach uh bernard something other broad griffith maybe he uh he looked like john thompson Every player on the team was black. Everything was polished perfectly. It was like a military unit in, a, in the mm -hmm. best way. And they, and Kerry Kittles was incredible. And they destroyed their very, very good opponent badly. And one of, they, they had like a, they had six, eight guys all over the place, mm -hmm. including like a young sophomore. You could tell he looked like he was 11 years old. He came in late in the game, the 30 point blowout. And uh, they have the ball and there's seconds to go. And he took like a 26 foot shot. The game's over. They're up, they're up by 30. And that head coach ran. He didn't run. He walked briskly <laughs> to this young man. And I, I wanted to hear it. So I got up from my bleachers. We were playing next to listen. And he scolded him about, we don't just preach taking good shots during the game sometimes. We only take good shots. And you can't make that shot right now. We're up 30 points. And he and this kid's ears were back. Like he, and I don't know. I wish I knew the name. He probably tried to be a very good player. But I turned to my team. I said, guys, we talk about being disciplined. That's discipline. It starts from the top. There, there is, that's, there's a reason why these guys are all so good. And while Kerry Kittles bubbled up into being an NBA player, he's a skinny guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's coaching. That's culture, right? Those little things make yep. such a difference. Yep. And so when I talk about people like Mike Below and I think it's Spolster in Miami, these coaches are impacting culture that way. And it makes a big difference. Coach, I'll say, because uh, uh, you had my Kawhi point earlier. Um, yeah. similar. But, you owe him one point, David. <laughs> <laughs> but it, my, my, my position is, is somewhat similar to yours. It's that I don't think that we've overestimated Kawhi. I think Kawhi has ca ca caused a halo effect, right? Because Kawhi has been so great and excellent that we've seen him, right, in this last yeah. run with Toronto. And remember, the last time we saw him before that, he was giving the Kevin Durant Golden State Warriors the business, right? Mm -hmm. So Zaza Pachulia hurt his ankle, right? Uh, right, until, until that happened. 
And so because of that, it made us overestimate who Lou, Montrez, and everybody else really was. Because we're like, oh, Kawhi's good. No problem. These guys will be fine. And what we're seeing is, again, Doc and Kawhi, as I said to Stan last week, they have the reservoir to tap into and be like, we know what to do. These other dudes, what, what have they ever won or gone? They, they have no closeout experience or anything. So it's kind of this weird thing where it's like Kawhi's and Doc know what's up, but Landry Shamit, where is he? The Mar- Marcus Morris, where is he? Zubach, like Paul George, like these guys, Lou, Montrez, like they're not, they don't have it. And look, Denver can easily beat them tomorrow night. Like I, that wouldn't surprise sure. anyone. It's game seven. So, it, and that's the thing when you, when you're not quite connected in that way, right? Like, and that's where they're at. I don't, I, I don't want to be a Paul George hater. I don't, I, I think he's a really good player. Yeah. But this seems to keep, we've talked about the Clippers for almost an hour and you just said the words Paul George for the first time. Like, <laughs> meanwhile, he's a max player, and they gave up 150 prospects to get him, including yeah. Shea, right? Like, like this is a – like, I think that he's rated at, like, a 92, and I rate him, like, an 87. I don't think he's, like, terrible. I'm making up some weird numbers. But, like, but to me, it's, like, it's never quite the, like, no, they're good because they're fine because they have Paul George on the team. That's not how Paul George's game operates. Like, he right. is an excellent player, but you are not, like, just – we're good now because we got this guy. Like, that's, right. uh, they... the two of them, like Kawhi and Paul George, are gonna have to play 46 minutes tomorrow night and like be excellent on both ends. Like, that that's what they have to do because clearly they, you know, Jokic, you have to, if you're, and tell me if I'm wrong, coach, if you're Doc, all right, we cannot let Jokic and Murray beat us, right? You gotta let Millsap and these other dudes, you guys gotta beat us. I am not letting Jokic and Murray go nuts over here. Gary Harris and Paul Millsap, you hit open jumpers, and if you win, fine. Like, <laughs> wait, you went through this little Shamit thing, this and, and Millsap. That play early, there was a play where Landry Shamit jumps with his knee forward into Millsap's quad. Yeah, remember this play? Yeah, and I, I when I first saw it, I'm like, oh, these things happen. And like, then they showed it again and again. I'm like, that is dirty. And then Millsap freaks on the ref. And I'm like, I have, by that point, I'm like, kind of rooting for Millsap here. I think he's right. And then Millsap gets a tech. So then yeah. Kawhi shoots a technical free throw, and I'm like, oh! Like, I just went from this passion observer to, like, fully rooting <laughs> for the Nuggets because that was BS. <laughs> like, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what Doc does because Jokic is killing it from three. He's, like, at yeah. 46% from three in the postseason. And, and his mid-range cup, right? I tweeted uh, yesterday, he's kind of like uh, – Dirk as a shooter and Magic as a passer. That's how he's playing right now. He's not at Dirk as a shooter. He's moving that direction. His I trust his mid-range shot more than anyone in the bubble. He maybe even more Jokic. It's so good. The long two, the mid-range two, the 46% from three, great passing. Like, I, I don't know if they're going to play Zubac. Maybe, maybe they just go small, but then Jokic can shoot over him. I, I go Jermichael Green because at least like with, I like Jermichael Green right? too. Like I mean because what what is I don't even know what Trez is doing. Like I I, I got to watch him and I'm like what what what's happening right now? Like what are you doing? Yeah, Trez is. I mean this is what happens when you when you're out a long time. It's just hard to recover and suddenly play this intense playoff basketball. Uh, I, we're not gonna have time for this. Too bad. But maybe maybe on well Friday they won't have an answer yet. Then Tony not coming back. Yeah. Uh, we you know he's he had I tweeted this yesterday too and I know Henry feels this way. Uh, it, this wasn't because D'Antoni's not a good coach, right? D'Antoni's going to have a job somewhere else, I'm assuming. <laughs> he knew all year long he wouldn't be back. Yeah. Uh, I think he suspected anyway. Uh, if I'm Houston, if I can win 55-plus or so games a year, have one of the world's best players on my team, and we keep getting knocked out, well, that's what the Suns have with Steve Nash. And, boy, wouldn't they like to get those years back when they broke up that incredible team. Uh, Houston's in good hands, but the whole Daryl Morey China thing, like, I don't, I don't know what they're going to do. It's not just the D'Antoni question, Henry. It's what are you going to do with, with Russell Westbrook and James Harden even? Well, like, I don't know what they're going to do. Tillman is broke. So I think, so I think he's going to try to, like, get, sell off. Like, he, I, think, I don't think he, he's not going to pay a big-time head coach. He's going to pay a first Why guy. Why hire Sam, and right. And then Mur- Maury's got one year left on his deal, so he's going to essentially also be a lame duck in his last year. And it's just. Cause, and they're not going to change that roster, right? It's going to be a bunch of six, eight dudes, and a coach is going to be like, what is this? And I just – I don't know what you do in Houston. Blow it up, start over. <laughs> these teams are all – like, all these West teams are – except for the Nuggets – are all in to win right now, right? Like, yeah. 
Like yeah. the, the Clippers gave everything to get yeah. this roster together, right? The Lakers gave everything. Nobody has a long-term plan here. So like if it doesn't work, if our, it will not be working for two of these three teams and they're all going to have like – Right. Like a and OKC and Denver and Utah and the Warriors, Phoenix – yeah. Like there, there's going to be a there's Memphis, gonna be a, the Grizzlies, <laughs> potentially the Memphis. Conference is a champ next year. Then it sounds like if this doesn't work out. <laughs> okay, I think we're just about out of time. Um, do you uh, do you want to show us that hoodie, Indiana, before we go? Or oh, oh, video? okay. I'm sorry, the coolest thing in the world, you guys. Um, this her company stuff. Look at yeah, this, so, look at that. Oh, oh. Later, but- Merch is coming. Everyone's going to be matching uniforms. Yay. Let's go. All right. Thanks, Adina. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Yes. (laughs) Bye.